If you have your Bibles handy, and I trust that you do, go ahead and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 22. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 22. As you're turning there, I will just say this in the beginning, that all over America, churches are being planted. But at the same time, all over America, churches are closing their doors. And it's been estimated that 3,000 new churches are planted each and every year, that number varying sometimes up, sometimes down. But at the same point in time, there is a staggering 7,000 churches that are closing their doors. So here's my question. Out of those 3,000 new churches being planted, how many of them are centered upon the Word of God? How many of them are devoting each Sunday to the proclamation and the explanation of Holy Scripture? The Lord knows, but probably not many. By looking at the church landscape, it's safe to say that the church is becoming increasingly shallow and increasingly superficial in their approach to preaching and teaching. We become so focused on the unchurched and so focused on being politically correct, not wanting to offend anyone, that we are neglecting the word. In fact, the church has become so pulled into the culture and the times that the church is getting their message from the times as opposed to preaching to the times. Big difference. That is why there is the watering down of the preaching. And the watering down of the word has led to a tragedy. And it is a reality. But what is it? You ready for it? The de-churching of the church. Does that make sense? The de-churching of the church. We're so focused on accommodating to the unchurched that in the process of doing so, we have de-churched the church. No longer focusing on that which is important and vital. And that is the proclamation and explanation of the Word of God. Not abusing the word, not twisting the word to our own destruction, as the Bible says, but teaching it soundly. Giving the church sound, healthy, wholesome doctrine. So the church has begun to drift from Scripture and drifting into dangerous waters, the waters of lukewarmness, worldliness, and apathy. So the church, how I see it, needs to be pulled back into the dock of truth. So beginning this Lord's Day, we are going to start our journey in a new series. I've entitled, Seven Survival Commands. Seven Survival Commands. So that the church can not only survive, but thrive and be healthy and be what she has been called to be. I just don't want to have doors open and no spiritual life. Physical life is one thing. Spiritual life is another. And I feel that this series that God has put upon my heart will help us and aid us and encourage us. So look with me at 1 Thessalonians 5.16. And we'll conclude at verse 22. Paul says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Don't be misled by the use of prophecies. That's really speaking of the various forms of prophesying, both revelation and reiteration. Preaching is a form of prophesying how the New Testament uses that particular word. Every time I stand behind this pulpit, there is prophesying. I am reiterating what God has given us in the Word. Paul says, don't despise, in essence, the Word. Don't despise preaching. Verse 21, test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Those seven commands that God gives, and if you're a musician, you'll understand what I mean by this, He gives them like in a staccato fashion, just boom, 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 right down the list, hammering out these seven 
dogmatic commands. These are not suggestions. These are rather commands. And before we pray and we plunge into our first message, allow me to say this. These commands are not a legalistic checkoff list, okay? They're not just a checkoff list that the believer is to crank out in a cold, external, mechanical fashion. These are seven virtues that I just read to you that should be flowing from the heart of the redeemed. So we must view this section of Scripture not so much as a checklist, but as a thermometer to test our temperature. It's very important that we do personal inventory, that we test our temperature. This section of Scripture will help us to test our progress of sanctification. This section of Scripture will also test our theology. What do you mean? The truth that you and I cling so tightly to, what is it producing in your heart and in your life? Now, if you're familiar with the Thessalonians to any small degree, you will know that the Thessalonians was a hot church, red hot for the Lord. She was stable. Amen. She was persevering. She was a healthy church. And in fact, you'll find Paul in 2 Thessalonians boasting of them. Paul didn't do that for every church. Paul didn't boast about, and you would think he was, he pioneered a good bit of them, didn't he? You think as a pioneer of a church, you'd boast in every baby that you birthed. But there's some that stuck out to Paul more than others. That's this church. So as the pioneer of this church, Paul sent them a letter. And this letter, as we're going to see in weeks to come, is filled with encouragement, instruction, and just a touch of correction. But he closes his letter with these seven commands. Why? To keep them from drifting. To keep them pushing forward. Now, here's my aim for today. Here's my goal. Here's what I feel my God-given assignment is for today. As I prayed and I wrestled with God and as I tried to jot down all the thoughts that I had and I tried to organize them, where to begin, where to start, and how to end, that's important as a minister. It is. It's important. And my aim, how I feel, is that we're going to, first and foremost, we're going to look in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians to see what a New Testament church looks like. Because I think we have to start there. Before I say, hey, we need to survive and thrive as a church. Survive under what condition? Survive doing what? You follow my train of thought, what I'm trying to to say. I don't doubt your ability to understand, but mine to communicate it. Because it may be clear here for me, but it may be fog down there. Okay? So what kind of environment do we need to survive in and to thrive? So in order to know all that, we got to know what the church is supposed to look like. Not comparing ourselves with the church that we grew up in. Hello. Not comparing ourselves with this church or that church or whatever church has got the, the hottest fad, getting the greatest results at the moment. That's fine and good, and I'm sure a lot of kingdom work is being done. But the assignment of any God-given pastor is to go first and foremost to the beginning. To go to our roots. What is it the church is to be? What is our identity? And if you notice, the past 15 years, the church has struggled drastically with her identity. Wrestling, marketing, trying to fit into the culture, fit into the age. And in the process of doing so, now we're at times sitting and thinking, what has happened? This isn't the church I remember. What, 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 has, what has happened could it be the process of the de-churching of the church? I couldn't help, but as I begin to look through the Scriptures myself as to what the church is to look like, I couldn't help but think of Revelation 2.5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. I'm not saying every church falls into this category. But if we follow the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, even what He echoed in Matthew 24, and even what the prophets and even what the, the apostles had prophesied, they prophesied that there would come a time, 
there would come a season of time when the church would begin to apostatize and drift away. That's why pastors must make it their God-given duty to keep the church anchored where she belongs, and that's in the dock of truth. Let's pray and ask God's blessing as we minister a message entitled, The Ideal Church. The Ideal Church. Father, we come to you. And Father, I come to you in need. Father, I need you to help me. Father, I need your grace and your Holy Spirit at this time to guard my mind, Father. Guard my mind, Father, and help me to speak the things that you would have me to speak, the things that will be beneficial and profitable for us all to hear, Father. And Lord, you see how my heart is full. and You see all the thoughts that are in my mind, Father. So Lord, I pray that you would help me, Lord. Lord, that your words would come to me on a Holy Spirit conveyor belt, Lord. Lord, on what you want me to speak. Because Lord, these are your sheep. You are the shepherd of this church. I am merely an under-shepherd. I am merely a busboy, nothing more, nothing less, Lord, just to deliver your word. So, Lord, help me, Lord, and guard us from error. Help us to speak truth so that our inner man can be strengthened at this time by power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I entitled this message, The Ideal Church, because every single one of you have a thing in your mind that says, I think this is the ideal church, and you have your, you have your criteria. Every one of us have our own ideology on what the church is to look like, how the people are to dress, how the pastor is to preach. We all have our own ideologies. Some of those are from tradition. Some of those are good. Some of them are bad and they're wrong. And I'm not here to put a finger on, hey, that's wrong, this is wrong, and I'm a know-it-all. I'm here to simply point you to the Scripture and let the Bible speak. You wonder, why does this guy use so much scripture? Because that's all I know what to do. I don't have anything else to say. I don't know anything. I don't know anything. So I go to the book that knows it all, and I do my best with the Holy Spirit to untangle things and give them to you and try not to mess that up in the process. If you get one shot, you don't get a do-over on the message. wish you did. But you don't. One shot out the gate. Here we go. So what is the ideal church? Right now, I've said that three times. I'm sure in your mind, you're already getting a list together. On what it is to look like, how it's to feel, how the lights are to be, how the songs are to be, the tempo is to be. You all got your own ideologies. We all do. Every single one of us, myself included. Mm -hmm. What does the book say? Not the Assemblies of God, the Church of God, the Four Square, the Methodist. What's the book say? What's the Word say? The Holy Bible, what's it say? Good starting point is Jesus, he had a lot to say about the church, didn't he? First he said, I'm going to build it. <laughs> Amen. I love it. He says, I'm going to build it. I'm the chief architect. I am going to build the church. And I love that emphatic, I will build my church. What a promise. So Jesus knows in his mind, I know what my church is to look like. I know what it's to sound like. And I know what our ministries are to be and what our functions are to be. And if you get in line with my blueprints, I will anoint you, I will help you, I will strengthen you, and I will guide you into all truth. Because do you know how bad he wants to build the church? Man, he's up in heaven thinking like, come on, no, no, I got I left you a book. Now, I'm not saying there's not room for opinions and all that, but you just can't drift too far now. There's things that you got to be close-fisted with, okay? Like, sorry, not bending. Sorry, not happening. And there's other things you can be open-handed with. And you say, hmm, that's fine. That's okay. But that's not. You know, Jesus has those things. He has those criteria. Those things that are close-fisted and those that are open hand But Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. How many know that in Acts chapter 2, something powerful happened? What was it? The Spirit came down and what happened? Life happened. Just like when God was forming man in the beginning, just out of dust. And there was a form there, but no life. And then God 
breathed. And what happened? He became a what? A living soul. He breathed life into Adam. And in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit came down and breathed life into the church. And that's when the process of construction began. When God stooped down and by means of the Holy Spirit breathed life into how many people? 120 of them. And Acts 2, I didn't qualify my questions probably. Acts 2, I know what I'm thinking, don't you? Acts 2, see what I'm saying? Acts 2, 120 felt the life of God. Spirit of God. And then the sound of Pentecost echoed through the temple court. Josephus says there could be as many as 250,000 that could be squeezed in that temple area. That's a lot. That's a lot. And 3,000 that day had something miraculous happen. They experienced that same life. That, my friend, is the process, the beginning stages, chapter 1 of God building His church. And it started off so glorious, it started off so marvelous, but how many know opposition followed the progress? Always does. When there's progress, there's persecution. When there's progress, there's resistance. There's going to be resistance from the outside and resistance from the inside. Resistance. I think it's be done this way. Let's go left. Let's go right. Let's go straight. Let's do this. Let's do that. Right? Resistance. The early church had persecution, dissension, infiltration, sin in the church. But Jesus also said, I'm not only going to build my church, but the gates of what? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. How many know that hell was beating at the door of the early church, but the flames didn't prevail? The church marched forward, and the power of the Holy Spirit and the truth of the Word of God, lives were being saved, people were being transformed. Why? The church was being the church. The gates of hell didn't prevail because the church then allowed God His rightful place. The early church then allowed the Word of God to be her compass. Maybe we get back to that. The early church allowed the power of the Holy Spirit to energize them and equip them. So they stayed in the parameters of the blueprints. And any time the church began to drift, like the church at Corinth, we're studying it on Wednesday nights, when they begin to drift, what would happen? A letter of correction would be issued. Why? Following my imagery to pull them back into the dock of truth. To say, no, 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 don't, don't do that. Don't, that's wrong. Don't do that. Don't do that. There's a lot of things according the Corinthians did that was wrong and sinful, right? Right. And, and, and then Paul, he, he was used of God to send them two letters that we do have. Others were lost. But the letters we do have to give them correction, to bring them back in so the church can continue to be the church. People saved, lives changed, people healed, people filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a church then. But the church today, as already mentioned in my introduction, we are not allowing the Word of God to be our compass. People wonder why the church isn't like it used to be. Because we've drifted. The hearts of the people is no longer conditioned to hear the Word. Now we want it light and keep it moving. Right? Yeah. We want sermonettes for Christianettes. 20 minutes, 30 max. I'm lucky I'm, you know, I'm not a, I'm a well, I'm all, well, I'm not a Puritan, but Puritans would have seven points, ten points, and preach two hours. And guess what? People loved it. They didn't have TV then, didn't have internet then, didn't have everything, and just a click away. Right? They couldn't get enough of the Word. They wanted to learn more and more of Jesus. They wanted to learn more and more of being of the way. So now we're just in a hurry. The church can be summarized, Revelation 3.1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you're alive, but you're dead. 
A lot of activity, a lot of physical life, but no spiritual life. The church that he is in building, the gates of hell will prevail. All right, pastor, what's the ideal church? What is it? Good churches. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now, we don't have time to go through the entirety of this, but I simply just want to make a little pit stop at each verse, pull out a characteristic, something to hang in our spirits, like, man, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to to seem so obvious, so elementary, so fundamental. But sometimes it's good to get back to the fundamentals, isn't it? Absolutely. Like Vince Lombardi with the Packers. Was it his second year as a coach he did this, Keith? Was it his second year? Yeah, the first year was a total flop with the Packers. Flop. And he walked in at the end of the season. He said, all right, boys. Stood up on a chair. And he said, this, talking to NFL athletes, this is a football. Okay, we know that. Do you? It's a football. Could a pastor today say, okay, this is a Bible. I know we all have one. We've got to read it and use it and apply it. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what does the Bible say? What are some? What does the ideal church look like? 1 Thessalonians 1 and 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians. In God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the first mark of an ideal church. You know what it is? A saved church. Notice what it says. Where, where are these Thessalonians? They are where? In, thank you. They are in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the double emphasis. Don't have time to explain. But there's in God the Father, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not everybody is in God and in Christ. Some are in Adam and some are in Christ. Paul says the ideal church, here's the ideal church, be saved. Amen. Be in Christ. The church is the ecclesia. We are the called out ones who have been called out of darkness and into the glorious light. The ideal church is to have a church that's filled with everybody that's born again and washed in the blood. Now, I know that can't be a reality. I know Matthew 13, the wheat and tares. I got it. I know it. I get it. But man, the ideal church would be what? We're all washed in the blood. We're all saved. We're all on fire for Jesus. We all want more of the Lord. That is the ideal church to be in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Thessalonians, they had had experienced that effectual call. What do you mean that effectual call? That pull, that tug, that's upon the mind, the heart, and the will. Amen. I was talking to Doc Stone just last night and just speaking with him. I was reminded, I'm sure Adam, you'd remember this, when he shared his testimony on how he became a Christian. It was just him and the New Testament involved. That's it. He devoured the New Testament in just a week. At the end of the week, he's, I am saved. I am born again. What happened? There was an effectual call. There was something pulling at the intellect that stirred the emotions, that pulled the will. It says, I want Jesus. And guess what? Jesus says, I want you too. Guess what? Saved. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, was trying to get home. It was snowing like crazy. So he stopped to get some uh, rest from the storm, and he walked into a little Methodist church. It was snowing so bad, even the pastor couldn't get there. So there was a guy who in Spurgeon described him as just a, a simple layman. He wasn't called in the fivefold. He was just a simple layman. But, but you know, the people insisted, hey, we, we need a word. So he, he got up there, and he kind of thumbed through his Bible. He didn't know what he was doing. This is Spurgeon's explanation on it. And the man simply said, look and live. He says, I'm talking to you, young man. Look and live. And Spurgeon said, my heart was smitten. And again, this is Spurgeon talking. He was the one that was there. And he said, the guy wasn't even called. He's just a simple layman. But the Word, the Word and the Spirit, he says, my heart was smitten. Do you remember that day when your heart was smitten? Do you remember that day when you're like, Paul, oh, wretched man that I am? 
That's the ideal church. Those who are aware of their depravity and they are aware of the glorious majesty of the world's Redeemer. That is an ideal church. We gather it in as depraved people, but have been touched by the grace of God. And we have the Spirit of God. And we are a saved church. And we get the privilege to stand in a sanctuary, to lift our voices, and to give Him praise, glory, and honor for such a great salvation. Honey, I'm here to tell you, you don't outgrow that. You don't outgrow that. That desire to come into the house and say, thank God I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. Thank God I'm not going to a devil's hell. Thank God I'm going to heaven. Thank God He saved me. Thank God He pulled at the strings of my heart. He smit me. We need more of that. You got people just kind of moseying down to the altar. I'll make a decision. Yes, I'll accept them. What? <laughs> it should be, Lord. Will you accept me? Not this, well, Lord, I accept you. This holy, majestic, divine being. I accept you. And God's like, oh, thanks. Appreciate that. Lord, will you accept me? And that, those are the words that will flow off the lips of a heart that's been smitten. The Thessalonians were smitten. And Paul says, you're in God and you're in the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 2.37 says this. Acts 2.37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. There it is, smitten. Like a sword. That's the word of God though, isn't it? It's like a sword, right? It penetrates. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says, Repent. So notice when the word was proclaimed, their hearts were smitten, and their response was this, What am I to do? I don't know what to do. All I know is I've been exposed for what I am, and this ain't going to work. This ain't going to work. Peter told him what will work. You know what that is? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2 now, 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2. Paul says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. The ideal church. You're thankful for it. Isn't that what Paul said? He said, we give thanks to God always for you all. Paul says, I, th I thank God. I thank God for the Thessalonians. I thank God for that church. It's a good place to be, isn't it? To be thankful for your church. Amen. The ideal church, if you're thankful for it. You know why? Because you know it's a, it's a rare thing. Yes or no? It's a rare thing. If you took a poll, you know, tell how many people who go from church to church and say, you know, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I don't know. And there's some that just settle. But you know what? God is faithful, isn't He? He's faithful not just to build the ideal church. He's faithful to lead that heart that is thirsting and longing for truth. So Paul says, we give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. Verse 3 says this, Thessalonians 1 and 3, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. What's an ideal church? A saved church. Here's the second mark, a serving church. You see it there in verse 3? Remembering without ceasing your what? Work of faith. Labor of love, patience of hope, faith, love, hope, the Christian triad. So verse 3 tells us that they were truly in God, and they were truly in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because their faith worked. Their faith produced something. Yes, we're saved by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, but saving faith never stands alone. Work of faith, a faith that works. 
A faith that's a, and I know I've said this before, but let me say it again because I must say it. Faith is not something you can manufacture on your own. Some say, well, right now you're exhibiting faith. You're sitting on that pew. That's faith. When you open that Coke can, you take a drink. That's faith. You don't really know that's Coke in that can. Some will say, oh, that's faith when you got on that airplane and flew from that destination to that destination. That's faith. No, that's not. That's mathematical probability. Mathematical probability is if I sit down, it won't break. Mathematical probability is if I get on this bird in the sky, I'm going to make it. Mathematical probability, if I open this Coke and drink it, I'm going to be just fine and probably get another one. But faith, the ability to believe in God for your salvation. But yet we can't believe Him for other things. It's amazing. That, my friend, is supernatural. That is a faith that works. That is a faith that is given and granted by God, a faith that works. And a faith that works will not only save you, but it will lead you into serving. Serving, absolutely. And then he adds labor of love, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. I wish I had time to articulate all these, but I don't. Time's already getting away from me. But again, this is just the purpose of this message is big picture. Big picture. So the ideal church, save church, serving church. Your faith is working. It's done in love. And you have hope. Well, what does all that mean? Well, I've heard it said this way. Faith looks back at the crucified Savior. Love looks up at the crowned Savior. And hope looks forward to the coming Savior. Thessalonians had all that going. Engaged in Christian service. Because their faith was not static. It wasn't stale. It was active. It was energized by the Spirit of God. Guided by the Word of God. Okay, now look at verse 5, 1 Thessalonians 1 and 5. I love this. Paul says, for our gospel. So the ideal church, saved and serving. For our gospel didn't come to you in word only, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much conviction. That's been better translated, conviction, much conviction. As you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Real simple here. Here is the tool to build the church. Did you catch it? For our gospel did not come to you in word only. So Paul says the tool that builds the church is the proclamation of the word of God. Did you catch that? For there to be a saved church, a church that's serving, a church that knows her boundaries, you've got to be instructed from what? The word. The word. Not a workbook from Lifeway. The word. I'm not saying the workbook from Lifeway is a bad thing. I'm sure it's got good stuff in there. Nothing wrong with that. But at the end of the day, it's the Word, isn't it? And absolutely. So Paul, he, he, he did oh, anyway, Paul, I don't want to go down that road. Paul said, here's the tool for building. It's the Word, but not the Word only. The Word preached in power, in the Holy Spirit, and in much conviction. Then he says this in verse 6. So a saved church, serving church. Ideal church, you're thankful for it. The tool to build it is the Word. Now look at verse 6. 1 Thessalonians 1 and 6. And you became followers of us and of the Lord. We're just running down the chapter here. He says, you became followers of us and the Lord. Well, what is that? That's a submitted church. Hello? A submitted church. Paul says, you became followers of us and of the Lord. Now, I know for some it's confusing here. It's like, well, why did he put the Lord after the apostles? He says, you became followers of us and of the Lord. Why not? You became followers of the Lord and us. Why that particular order? For this reason. Paul says, you submitted to the leadership that God put in your life, and you followed not only our teaching, but you followed our life. You followed our example. Remember my illustration I used a long time ago, the, the tracing paper? Remember that? Yeah, because I'm, I'm a crummy drawer. I can't draw at all. When I was a little kid, to make mommy happy, I had to draw a pretty picture like my brother could. 
I would get tracing paper and I would, I would outline that picture. Well, Paul says, that's what I am. That's what I was. Just put your tracing paper of your life over mine and you'll get Jesus. So the ideal church is not only saved and serving, but has proper submission. Now, I know all these, you can preach on every one of these points. But again, this purpose of this is survey big picture before we go into chapter 5 next week. We've got to see what the church is to be about first. So this is to be a submitted church. You became followers of us and of the Lord. Then he says this, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. A suffering church. Not only is a church, the ideal church, saved, serving, and rightly submitted, but the church knows how to suffer well. Having received the word in much affliction. And that is so true. The reformers used to say this. That two things will lead you to the Lord, either affliction or affection. And it's true. For some, it takes a tragedy. It takes a trial. You feel so afflicted, but yet it leads you to the ultimate good, the Lord. And there's some, you're just so overwhelmed by the love of God. That's what it takes. But regardless, it's either affliction or affection. And Paul says, you received the word. And when you did, persecution, the flames got turned upward. The heat was put on. But you know what? The Thessalonians did not allow the suffering to short circuit their faith or the power of God in their life. Let me be real. When we go through hard times, our faith at times seems to waver, doesn't it? Our thoughts sometimes can get in dark places, right or wrong, when suffering gets turned up. What to do? Where to go? What to do? Lord, where are you, Lord? Where are you? I feel forsaken, Lord. But look at verse 7 of chapter 1. How did the Thessalonians, how did they handle the heat of suffering. How did they respond to suffering? What did they do? It says in verse 7, so that, so that what? You were examples. Wait a second. What happened with verse 6 and verse 7? What's the connection here? You became followers of us. Okay. Proper submission. They went through suffering And then directly after speaking of submission and suffering, he says, all of that happened so that, a hint of purpose clause, in order that you were examples to all that believe. What is that? I view that as a sanctified church. They were growing. I'm the only one getting happy. That's okay. I see. Of course, I know I spent hours with it. I know. But here's the thing. They didn't allow the suffering to short-circuit their progress. Let me say it this way. They didn't just, whoop, get saved and stop walking. They kept growing, maturing, advancing, developing, to the point Paul says in verse 6, you were followers of us. We were your example. Now you became the example. You catch that in verse 7? You see it? I hope so. Paul says, now you're the example. Sanctified church. Don't get tripped up on that term. I know we don't use it much, sanctification. Oh, what's it mean? Well, there's different words, synonyms, really. You think about sanctification, think about dedication, consecration, separation, purification. All of those words amplify what sanctification is. Amen? Amen. So that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. They were a sanctified church. Look at verse 8 now. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Boy, isn't that good? From you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God is spread abroad so that we don't need to speak anything. What's that? Soul winning church. I think we're starting to get a picture, a portrait of the ideal church. It's a church that say they've had their hearts smitten, Right? They're serving in faith, love, and hope. There's proper submission. They know how to endure suffering. They're sanctified. They're outwinning souls. That sounds like a good church. That's the ideal church. That's the church at Thessalonica. That's why Paul boasted about it. He says, for from you sounded out. 
I know time is gone, but bear with me. Golden Corral is still going to be there or wherever you go. I just threw that out there. I've never even been there. Well, the new one anyway. Sounded out. I love that word. Sounded out. It means this. It means to the sound of a trumpet or the rolling of thunder. It speaks of reverb. Reverb, you know, sound when it bounces off objects. If you clap your hands, what's going to happen? Why? Because that noise is bouncing off the walls, the pews, everything. That's the same word here. He says, from you reverberated what? The word. What noise are you making in life? What kind of noise are you making? Huh? You're making some noise. Every one of us make noise. Even when you don't say anything, that's making some noise. Hello? Paul says, from you sounded out, meaning the word reverberated off the minds and the hearts of people. Boy, that's good. Sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith to God has spread. And Paul says, we don't need to say anything. He says, I don't even have to preach a sermon. You guys are doing such a good job. So the Ideo Church is a soul-winning church. And he says in verse 9, we're almost done. Look at verse 9. For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you. For they themselves. Who are they? Who are these people? Well, these were people that were talking about the Thessalonians. Can I say this? That the ideal church will be talked about. The ideal church will be talked about. Man, that's an ideal church. People being saved. Serving, submitted, don't get bogged down in suffering, are sanctified, they're out winning souls. Man, what else could be added to this list that we talked about? Verse 10, and I'm done. Verse 10, and to what? A second coming church. That, ladies and gentlemen, is an ideal church. So now I hope you see the significance of why he gave this. Because now when we get to chapter 5, you see why Paul, gave, led by the Holy Spirit, why he wanted to preserve what they had. He did not want them to drift one iota from this. He says, keep winning souls. Keep serving. Stay submitted. Don't drift. So they were a second coming church. So Paul is going to help us next week. But the very first survival command is this. Rejoice always. Christian joy. Because when you lose your joy, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. You'll see it next week. When you lose a lot, of, when you lose your Christian joy, you lose a lot of things with it. And there's a tendency to begin to drift. Could you stand? Beloved, I know I, I, know I shared a lot today, but I, I wanted to purposely. I think it's so good to have our minds and our souls saturated with the Word, to be put in perspective what the ideal church is to be, what it is to look like. We need to be pulled back in to the dock of truth. I, I don't know about you. It won't be a safe church. I do. 